right on the side of the bag. So the first thing we want to do is set up the windscreen. So I need a couple of hands. We're just let's see. Okay, so I'm going to share a few tools that are really handy. If you're like me and you're not really a chainsaw person, this is a great tool. It's called an alligator lopper. It's an electric chainsaw. Um, and, but, and it can cut up to four inch diameter stuff. So if you've got big long branches that came down and you want to just cut them up and put them in your little backyard kiln, it works really great and it's pretty safe and I'm comfortable with it. <laughs> Another thing that you really want to have is some welding gloves. So if you need to get up close into the fire, you can do it. And some other just good leather gloves. Here's an interesting tool. This is a moisture meter. I'd like, is somebody willing to take this and go take some readings off of our feedstock? Volunteers? Anybody? Thank you. Um, so have you ever used one of these? No. So you just turn it on, and if the battery works, it'll come on. So, you know, if you have wood that's like more than 20, 25% moisture, it's just not going to be very efficient. So you really want your wood dry. And you stick those two prongs in the piece of wood. And it's, you know, puts a current through there and the resistance will tell you how much moisture is in there. What does it say? 11%. 11%, that's fantastic. We rarely see that in Oregon. Do we turn this over? Okay, we're, oh good, we're making progress here. Um, so we're going to have one open side. That's why there's a elbow here. So where's, which side should be open? Probably this one. The wind's coming from there. Yeah, so let's make this the open. You got it perfect. So just take the four foot pieces and put them in there and tighten them up. So you need four more pipes? Yeah, there should be the four. I thought they came over here. The f yeah, excuse me, the six footers. There's six on the bottom. No, there's, there should be three six footers for the top. There they are. Just didn't get them all. And then once those are tightened down, then we just we're just hanging these with wire. I have some more wire. It looks like some of the wire fell out. It's just a windscreen, you know. If I'm in a calm, I don't bother with it. Although you could, because it is gonna it's gonna protect you a little bit from the radiant heat. So there's some advantages but a lot of times I don't bother with it. And it's gonna be noisy, it's gonna bang and clang, so. But I think it's good here, we've got a good breeze. So the other essential tool for this work is a propane burner. Actually, it was uh, with a group of people doing a burn the other day and I forgot to bring the torch. And they were kind of mad at me, I said, Sorry, this is a test. Can you do this without the crutch or the propane burner? And they managed. But this does make it easier. How did you do it then? Huh? How did you do it? We just found some dry kindling and uh, I, think, uh, some, I think some kerosene was involved. <laughs> uh, can somebody screw that on there? You know, the threads are backwards. Here's a, you can tighten it. So before I ever start a burn, I make sure I've got water, live water. So where's the water? Oh, wow. <laughs> <Here's your number. laughs> I think we're good on that score. And then I wanna make sure I have some tools. The amount of heat that this puts out is pretty phenomenal once it gets going. You'd be quite surprised. I'm amazed, for instance, that I have eyebrows left, <laughs> but. <laughs> Um, just be careful. 
So we need to center this a little better inside the frame. You can move the frame or you can move the kiln. All right. Great. Is this, is this size of kiln typical of what you normally use? This is what we call the forestry kiln. So I have another model that is one foot smaller on top and bottom, so it's four feet across rather than five. It's the same height. And um, I really like that one. Well, that's the one I use when I'm doing burns in my yard, you know, because it doesn't take as much wood to fill it. and. I can kind of move it around by myself a little easier. I also have a little tiny one too, but uh, you know, you can do it in a hole in the ground. So, any questions up to this point? How much does it weigh? It weighs about 200 pounds. This one, the good one? This one does. And so when I first made these, I thought, well, that's why I put the crane on the trailer, so I could unload them myself. And it works. Um, but then first time I showed up in the woods with a forestry crew, <laughs> these guys just would pick it up and <laughs> run away with it. So um, anyway, we have the grandma way of doing things and we have the forestry crew way of doing things. So um, I think we're ready then to talk about the feedstock. So these guys have done a nice job of sorting it by size class because this is the first thing you want to think about is what size is your feedstock. Um, so what I want to do is get probably a bunch of medium-sized stuff like this. And we've already regular stuff. So let's take a bunch of stuff about that size and kind of fill it up to the rim. And you want to, you know, it needs to be loose, but not too loose. So um, pack it in there just a little bit. Great, perfect. And we'll save the littlest stuff there. You've got some of that little bitty stuff. Let's save that for the top. Save that for the top. Okay. And this piece here might want to come out, okay? But okay, just set it on the, pull it down set it on the other side. The species? Yeah. I don't know. Where did it come from? Where did this come from? Does somebody want to talk about the feedstock? PJ knows. PJ? Talk about the feedstock. Just, just talk about what we got here. Uh, so the feedstock is mainly, um, we got some pinion juniper limbs. Uh, you know, I've got a, a little bit of a personal and a professional interest. Um, I work for the Division of Forestry, Fire, and State Lands, and we're looking for, always looking for ways to deal with the, the waste from our fuels projects, but I also do a little bit of gardening as well, and I'm always looking for ways to try and improve what, uh, what I'm dealing with. Uh, I live in Tooele, and our soils out there are not great, so I'm always looking for ways to improve. So got a, quite a lot of information about this and, and some ideas about how to create some some char for myself so. PJ do you have those plugs I gave you yes they're in your pocket Darren yeah. told me I was fired if I lose them so great I had another one I kept in my purse but I can't find it so we have a drain hole here and uh, Sometimes I don't forget, I, sometimes I forget to plug it until we're ready to quench and then I have to try to put a plug in a hot kiln. <laughs> so anybody want to put this plug in for me? Wherever the drain hole is, it finger tight is fine. Okay, so this is a good start. Now let's put some of the really small stuff, like a, make a pile about just up to the top of the windscreen with the smaller stuff. Well. You know, um, it's about $500 worth of steel. So, and then the labor, you know, is more. Um, did you make it or did you? No, I have a fabricator in Medford that I work with. And we were able to get a pretty good price on this batch because I made six at once. If I make them one at a time, they're more expensive. Yeah, so. 
it's under a thousand dollars depending on how many I make you know I like to get the price down to oh could you um it's all going one way could you kind of take some of it and put it the other way just to crisscross it <laughs> no they know how to build fires I'm sure but you know that's one of the things that uh, the, when we make, when forestry workers are doing fuels projects in the woods and they're building the little fires, they have a protocol which is really about putting everything in a line. But that cuts off the airflow, and so you get more smoke. You get better complete combustion that way. But okay, that's good. <laughs> Woo, we're gonna have a blaze. In fact, let's take a little bit of that off. That's gonna be. We don't want to get the prison people too alarmed. <laughs> but yeah, we're we're if we if forestry workers are going to do this, they're going to have to kind of relearn the technique. Um, and I put a lot of kind of thinking into the economics of this. And what I learned was um, that to build those piles, and sometimes there might be a couple hundred piles per acre. It actually takes a long time. It's not that easy. Um, my uh, friends at Grayback Forestry said their best workers can make eight piles an hour, and this is a pile that's about this size because they're really carefully constructing them, and there's a lot of art to it. So, it, and they've got to go gather all the wood. So it's time consuming to construct the piles. When they actually burn them, when they're just burning them to get rid of them, they run through with a drip torch on a rainy day and light off, you know, two guys to light them all off. So the burning doesn't take that long. So potentially we might save some time if we're doing this method in the woods. We might, some, we might not take so much time piling because we're not so worried about getting them all compressed, uh, but we'll take more time burning it. So that's the trade-off. All right, who's a, who's a real pyro here who wants to operate the torch? Or who's qualified, I should say, to operate the torch? Anybody? Volunteers, fire, I'd like a fire person. Fire person? Yes, Lone Peak, Lone Peak stick up here. Just let them know about the flame lengths and the wind speed, which means it's gonna be laying over right where everybody's standing. Yeah, and the camera should back, back off or pretty soon here. So open that up, and then if you crack it just a little bit, and hit the piezo. If it's oh, there you go. Okay. So just you know, try and get the, the whole top of it evenly lit, so it can sustain a flame, and that's pretty much all you need to do. You want to light the top. I mean, light. Try to light the stuff. Um, yeah, what you're doing is perfect. Keep going. propane tank away from the flames. So this first part is pretty leisurely. It'll take probably half hour, 45 minutes for it to burn down before we're going to add some more. So this would be a time to take another look at our feedstock and see how we've got it sorted. So what have we got here? Um, so it looks 
pretty well sorted. Um, now, this kiln can consume a lot of feedstock. You'd be surprised. We'll have no trouble consuming what's on the ground here. We might want to, we'll definitely want to get into the smaller stuff here. And some of those four inch logs we can use. I don't think we're going to want to try these bigger ones unless we can cut them up, but we'll wait till closer to the end and decide how long. I'm, I work for the state, so yeah, just for interest's sake, uh, I, I'm the community forestry coordinator for the state, and I thought this might be a great example for communities to use uh, some of their excess. Uh, products yeah, from trimming trees. Uh, this might be a viable option for them just to get rid of those products instead of having to pay the costs for uh, waste removal. We want to stay here. <laughs> Kill them out. Um, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna fill it full of water so it's cold, and then oh, let me add. Oh, that's a good question. So the question's been asked: How do you unload the kiln? So when it's full and we're, we're done charring and we fill it full of water and we're gonna flood it. And once it's flooded, we know it's really out. And then we're gonna open the drain and let the water out. And at that point, it, the, one of the easiest ways to unload it is tip it over on its side. It's stable, it's quite stable on its side. And then it, you can put some roofing here and just scoop it out onto the roofing. We have a new version of this kiln that's being built right now at Umpqua Community College. It's got fork pockets on the bottom. And one, they're gonna try building us a tilt mechanism, so it'll be like a tilt bin. So you could come here with a tractor, pick up the whole bin of charcoal, and take it to wherever you want it. It's gonna be an improvement. Um, it makes the kiln heavier though, so it's no longer really movable by hand. That's the trade-off. And if we have a tilt mechanism, we could dump it right into a bigger hopper. So if we're out in the woods or if we're on a farm, um, we can just dump these with a, with a tractor with you know forks right into a bin or a dump truck. So, um, and it's, it's possible also if you didn't want to quench it individually, is once you've got the hot glowing coals, you could pick it up with a tractor and dump it into a bigger bin, um, maybe, you know, that's full of water or my, maybe um, one person, somebody's been asking also, do you have to use water to quench? Well, you know the fire triangle, right? To have a fire, what do you need? Fuel and heat, right? So to stop a fire, you've got to remove one of those things. Um, so, you know, quenching it with water, you're removing the oxygen pretty effectively. If you just put a lid on it, you're removing the oxygen, but you're, if, you know, with water, you're removing oxygen and heat. That's like a double, double sure, you're quenching it. If you put a lid on it, you're removing oxygen, but you're not removing heat very quickly. And if you've got a gap in your lid or a leak or something, you risk losing all your char if you get oxygen in there. Um, because it's going to take a long time to cool. This would probably, and we have done it this way, and well, the way I do it is I'll, I'll take just a piece of thin sheet steel that fits inside the kiln, because trying to seal it around the outside, these kilns warp. Making that seal is not easy. So um, I put it on the inside and then I seal it with, with dirt on the top. And, and that works pretty well, but it takes overnight to cool. It holds heat a long time, and what happens if you just sprayed a little water on it and didn't get it fully out, the, the heat retained in the char would evaporate the water and it could reignite and you'd lose your char. So that's one reason why I prefer water quenching. I really know it's that I've done the job, but sometimes you don't have a fire, tr fire engine or a lot of water, so then you're going to want to try the dry snuff method. And that works. Just, you know, be aware of the things you need to be aware of. And if you have a bigger kiln, like if you had a 20 yard dumpster trying to snuff it that way, it might take a couple days to cool down. I don't know, because I haven't really tried it. Where's Darren? Darren? 
We need to hear your story about trying to dry quench char and what happened. What happened? How would you learn the hard way about the combustion? Oh, uh, yeah, with Amaron's kilns, um, we didn't know much about quenching char. It was a new thing to us. And at the time, we, uh, in one instance, one of our very first demonstrations, uh, we asked people if they wanted some of the char when we were done. And so we sent a guy away with a couple of uh, five-gallon barrels of char and, and everything was great he's driving down the road and looks in the back of his truck and, and everything's on fire he has stopped in the middle and, and, and yeah it was pretty exciting for him we thought we had learned our lesson you think we'd smarten up after once but no we don't learn that quickly and we had to make a much bigger mistake to learn uh, and this was in nevada we were uh, making uh, we were set up there for uh, about a month uh, making biochar and bio oil from pinion juniper and working away and we filled up a super sack so a, a similar size of the kiln there uh, full of char and set it away from everything else away from all the equipment so it couldn't burn anything and we left it there for a week okay all good we rearrange things we're cleaning up the landing and we stack it next to everything else and we come back a couple days later and there's things stacked up but then there's a hole where something should have been <laughs> and overnight, that char burned up that whole sack. And, and <laughs> what was left? Up. So and I, I told this story to people, and they said, oh, some of that char you gave me I have in my warehouse with my equipment back home. Right? Oh, oh. <laughs> Get that out of there. <laughs> so once it's quenched, it should be, uh, there should be no chance of it of it uh, ever reigniting. But if you don't fully quench it, you can have a problem. And just storing char long term. Just without oxygen, and there can be problems as well, especially if there's moisture in the char. Thanks, Darren. Yeah, um, if there's enough moisture, though, and if it's made in this process, it's not a problem. I brought a bunch of empty pellet bags, so if you stick around to the end, you can get a, a cubic foot bag of char to take home with you. So I've got a bunch. Application rate, okay, so it depends. <laughs> um, if you're, let's just take a, a typical garden soil. Um, you know, in the Amazon, those terra preta soils have about, um, what is it, 20 tons per hectare of char, which is about 2%, like in the first six inches, about 2% of that is char. It doesn't seem like a lot, but it really is. Um, and so the first biochar researchers, they wanted to recreate these soils, so they would go ahead and add 20, 30, 40, 60, 80 tons per hectare to soils. And it was too much, especially because they were just adding the raw char without charging it with any nutrients or biology. And so often they would see worse results the first year because that char was sucking up the nitrogen that the plants needed. And, but they come back the second year, after the char had been in the soil for, for a while and had absorbed some nitrogen, and they'd see a big improvements. So, you know, this presented a real problem for the people who were trying to start a biochar industry. How do you sell something that's gonna give you worse results the first year? <laughs> and you have to wait till the two or three years before you get good results? That's not easy to do, so. People started composting it, and that gets it ready for the soil. But if you don't have a compost pile, and you just want to, you have a little bit, and you just want to add it now, the way to do it is, say you have a garden bed, um, to apply it about a quarter inch to a half inch, kind of sprinkling it on the top of the bed, and then just work it in. And as long as you're only putting a little, that little on at a time, it shouldn't be a problem. If you've got pH problems too, especially, you want to be very, really careful not to over apply it. Um, if you go ahead and mix it with compost or, you know, if you make a manure extract or use something like fish emulsion so you can soak it in it, um, then you can add a lot more at one time. A lot of times, um, People have not had a lot of char to add, so that saved a lot of people from making dumb mistakes because <laughs> they didn't have enough to get into trouble. Um, but if you only have a little bit and you want to really see the maximum benefit, 
um, you would maybe band it underneath a seed row, or you would, what I do, like when I'm transplanting out my tomatoes from gallon pots, I'll dig my hole and I'll, and I'll make this complete organic fertilizer that's seed meal and minerals and a couple other things and biochar and it's all mixed together. The char is not really charged. It's just plain char, but I mix it with all those other nutrients. And then I'll just work it into the soil around the planting hole and that seems to do really well. Yes. So that, that chicken manure combo that you have there. Uh huh. So did that sit the main reason that I came to this was that I've heard a little bit about biochar before, and I know that there's a lot of potential for for good. So I wanted to know more about how to do it, uh, actually how to do it, and, and we've had that's been very well demonstrated. That's a year old, but I'll tell you what I did. I took that chicken manure, I had a couple of buckets of it. It was very fresh, very nasty stuff. And I made some little piles, you know, and I, one was just plain chicken manure, one was 25% biochar, one was 50%, and I actually stuck a compost thermometer in it. So they were little piles, so they didn't heat up, you know, a lot, but they did heat up some, and I noticed that the one was 50% char was like three degrees hotter than the one with 25% hot char, which was hotter than the one with no char. So just by volume, like 50-50? 50, 50-50 50, 50 by volume. I usually talk about volume with biochar because, and that's a, that can be a problem when you're working with char, is like how do you figure out how much of the stuff you have? Because, you know, it's some, some of it's dense, some of it's light, it crushes, so getting a bulk density on it is kind of hard. And if it's wet, it's gonna weigh more than if it's dry. So working in volume is usually the easiest way to do it. The researchers, of course, will work in mass, so they have to figure out their bulk density and their particle density and all that stuff. But this is a moment where um, a brave person who's properly attired would approach that thing with a shovel and kind of poke some of those ends in that are falling out and just um, compact it a little bit. One of the things I really need to do is I need to get my welder to make me a long handled tool because you don't really want to get real close to that. So when I first started playing with these cone kilns and I had those smaller cone shaped kilns, I would build a little tiny fire in the bottom and then I would slowly build it up. And that worked and the sloping sides really help you build the fire up hot quickly. But then I realized if I put one of these ricks in the middle, you know, it would take me an hour to get up enough heat with a little building, this little fire working up. And I realized if I put a big rick in there, I've got my heat almost instantaneously. So it, it really speeds up the process. So I think at this point, you know, take some of those two and three, those three inch pieces, and let's put a layer of just three inch pieces in there. They can all be going the same way. So this, you know, we got a few little bursts of smoke when we add new material in, but overall the process is pretty clean and I think most of the smoke we're seeing is the grass burning and the little pieces that have fallen out. So in some of your slides, uh, the kilns were set on cinder block. Uh-huh. Is there advantage or disadvantage to doing that? Or you know, a lot of people have put them up on little legs or cinder blocks and maybe they're worried about burning the ground. I'm not sure. I haven't never really had to do that. We were at the Fire Expo, Firewise Expo in Medford on Saturday doing a demo and we were on their beautiful concrete pad and they, they made us put it on top of a pallet because that's all we had. <laughs> so it started burning. And so <laughs> we kept having to douse the pallet, but we saved their concrete. Um, it doesn't actually get that hot there. I, you know, I, I have one of these really cheap thermometers. Do you guys have here a good one of these? Infrared thermometer or a flare meter? No, oh, too bad, here. too bad. Um, If I can find the battery for it, we could try it, but.
You know, in the flame, one way you can tell the temperature of this stuff is by color. So there are color charts. So cherry red, something glowing like cherry red, it's about eight or 900 degrees Fahrenheit. Somebody put this battery in here for me. Thank you. Um, but I can, t I can tell you the temperature of the kiln. It's, um, that thing will not really tell you that the temperature of uh, the coals inside, but because the flame messes it up. But I get the outside of the kiln, and what I've noticed doing this is that right now the bottom of that kiln is pretty hot because the flame is right down there in there. But the temperatures we're talking about with the metal are, are pretty much wood stove temperatures. So 600 degrees Fahrenheit, it's not going to get a lot hotter than that. Thank you. Wow, this thing's actually working today. So we got, oh, 731 on the bottom. 730 in the middle. 780 at the top. 800 at the top. So, um... Yeah, it does get a little higher than 600. The small kilns only get to up to about 600 because they just don't build up as much heat as we have here. But what I've noticed is once this thing gets a little more full and the flame, the flaming zone is up higher in the kiln, the bottom's going to cool off pretty quickly. It'll be down at 300 degrees, you know, after this initial period. Does that have a Celsius scale? It does. What are those numbers? In Celsius, okay. The bottom is at 398 Celsius. The middle is reading about the same. The top is 425. And it's different over here, it's 460. It's cooler on this side, 220 right here. 240 there. So, so I need a pig on a spit. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, pig on a spit. So if you have an old 55 gallon drum lying around, cut it in half lengthwise. Or, you know, shave off part of the one edge and you can make a pretty nice kiln. Um, or whatever. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so is that, uh, I mean, did you buy the can itself or is that an old paint can? That oh, you buy them at the high hardware store for three or four bucks. Oh, okay. and then you don't have to worry about cleaning the paint out of it. Gotcha, yeah. It's just for a demonstration. Yeah, well, I was just thinking, you know, I've got a wood stove that yes. I heat my house with. There you go. And you can make charcoal got, that way. I've got tons of bark chips and stuff just uh -huh. from splitting wood. Uh, There's actually somebody who sells something called a Biocharlie. Uh -huh. It's a piece of stove yeah. pipe with two ends. Trying to figure out ways to have a little cheap backyard kit. Uh -huh. It strikes me, it's a little bit like some of the, the livestock waterers. Yes. Can, do Are people, people do that? Those? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, so it's galvanized. Steel, right. And the it? galvanizing will burn off, but yeah. it's not that big of a deal. So if you want to go buy a little, a little small um, galvanized stock tank, sort of a little trench shaped thing, you can use that. It'll work fine. It, so the, a lot of people, when they first see these cone kiln, you know, these slanty side things, they think that's there's something really magic about the angle or something that makes the char. The angle is nice for a lot of reasons, but it's not strictly necessary. So you know, you can make a, you can make char in a straight-sided container, and it'll work fine. One, the only thing that happens is sometimes, like when I had my big tube, I had this four-foot diameter tube, and I was putting mill ends in it, and some you know those straight-sided pieces of wood, a piece would get right up against the side, and it wouldn't char completely. But you know, it's just not a big deal if some of the wood doesn't char completely. You just save it and throw it in the next batch. You know, or or bury it deep in the soil. You know, there are a lot of people put big chunks of wood in their soil to hold moisture. How's that looking? That is fantastic. They're perfect. Lid on. Lid on. And let's wait till this burns down a little bit, and then we'll throw it on there and see what it does. Should we fire up the little tin can tea lud? Would people like to see that? Okay. Did anybody bring a tea kettle? 
So this you can make yourself. And I actually have a little e-book that you can buy for $5.95. <laughs> it's on my Backyard Biochar website. It's, you can just download it. It gives you complete instructions. I do this a lot with kids. This is a great, fun activity for kids and adults. So you need two cans. This is like a tomato paste or tomato uh, sauce can. And you need a hammer and a nail. And you make a bunch of holes. Kids love doing that. And then I put these little screws in there for feet so that air can come up through the bottom. And then these holes in the top, um, you know, and, and have the appropriate clothing. And go do a smaller pile rather than a bigger one so you're not going to risk your safety and your eyebrows. Um, how many people here are aware that a third of the world's population still cooks their food on an open fire? It's kind of mind-boggling, but, um, you know, that's like three billion people or something like that still cook on an open fire. And there's a lot of health implications for that because it's still, in, it's usually in a house. They have a, a cooking fire in a house. So the women and children are in there and sometimes they're burning dung and really smoky stuff and they're they're dying of respiratory illness at a, at a young age sometimes. So it's not really a very good thing health-wise. So there have been some initiatives, a lot of them, to develop cleaner cook stoves. And one of the cook stoves that was first initially developed was something called a rocket stove. And it's it's real simple. You can just, it's basically an elbow. And so you just put sticks in the bottom and then air comes in that same hole and um, it's just a more efficient cook stove so you can get more heat out of just a few little sticks and it's clean. And then uh, um, uh, also another group of people were starting to use these tea LUDs and develop tea LUDs that get wood, little wood gasifiers for people to use. So there have been a bunch of different designs. Um, some of them have gotten really fancy like they've added a fan um, they've added little swirl plates to, you know, clean up the combustion even more. And then you generally use, they can use chunks of wood or they could use um, dung pellets or seed hulls or a lot of waste stuff that wouldn't really get used otherwise. So they, people don't have to go cut down a tree. And that... Charcoal's not very hot. Let's get the propane torch. Or we're getting hand sanitizer in, right? Okay. Squirt some on there. This is looking pretty good. If we could get another smack down and, and kind of a spread to spread it a little more evenly, that would be good. This tea LED here, um, I have one that's got a fan in it. That's a, a, you know, it's a tube and you put pellets in it and on top of it is a barbecue grill. So it's like a gas grill that makes biochar out of pellets. It's pretty nice. The, um, the GEC that Darren was talking about, the gasifier kit, from All Power Labs. It's a different kind of gasifier and it makes a different kind of char. So this is a top lit updraft gasifier. The GEC is a downdraft gasifier <coughs> and it doesn't really make as much char. This makes a lot of char, but the downdraft version doesn't. Um, but it's the downdraft version is better if you want to actually use the gas because the gas passes through the hot charcoal layer because the, the flame is actually on the bottom. And so that cleans a lot of the tar out of the gas. So then you have this gas that you can actually run in a diesel engine. It's that clean. So that's, that's the beauty of a downdraft gasifier. You're, but you don't, it burns a lot of the char as part of that process. The top lit updraft gasifier is a much simpler device. And um, the gas that's produced 
is burned immediately in the flame. So it's really nice for cooking or heating things. Uh, I think you could put one of these under a hot tub and have a hot tub or whatever you want to do with it. I used it, actually I had a, um, a fan assisted one that I used to heat up big pots of water for <coughs> brewing. For brewing. So if you need to heat up like, you know, um, a two gallon pot, the, um, I was making beer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, actually, yeah, <laughs> no, actually it was wine. Um, so, um, yeah, these tea leads are really pretty easy to make out of, out of any kind, kind of can or um, barrel that you might have. And the bigger the can, the bigger the stuff you can put in it. So like my 55 gallon tea lead that I showed you, I can put mill ends in there, you know, two by four chunks. And it's, it's pretty nice because you just light it on the top and then you, you can walk away for an hour and come back and it's done. So how long will that take to turn into biochar? This, this here? Yeah. You know, this is amazing. This will burn for almost an hour once it gets going. And you, so you could you could make multiple pots of tea. You know, you could you could boil multiple kettles of water. And that's the thing that kind of surprised me is that, and the reason why I really liked um, heating up water for making wine for my brew, uh, because it's got more energy than propane. So if you're trying to heat up, you know, big pots of water using propane, you're going to use a lot of propane. And um, it's, it, this, will, this wood gas will heat up the water faster than propane, all for the price of some wood pellets. So, Ken Ludwig and I were just talking about another system that uh, another colleague has used before for making biochar, just a 55-gallon drum. Uh, filled with, uh, Ken was Those using slabs from the sawmill, but uh, the Chuck bottom. Gay, no. my former boss, would just use sticks from okay. the yard, and, and once it was full, cap it, and, uh, and uh, Chuck Gay's system, he just had a hole in the, in the barrel, about the size of your pinky, the, the diameter of your pinky, and then he'd set that barrel, he had some cement uh, blocks and T-posts. The forest health coordinator with forestry, fire, and state lands uh, came to basically see a project that uh, we have planned up um, the mountains and some of our foresters have planned up in the mountains and just came to see what it was all about. So he'd set the barrel up over a fire, two feet up over fire and with other wood he'd have a fire underneath it and all the gas would, uh, the moisture would come out that hole and he would just let it cool down and then when it was done, he'd take it and he'd fill the whole barrel full of water and run the whole thing through his chipper so he didn't lose any of the fines. Mm. And he said it, he had good success with that. And he, with that approach, and he'd chip it directly into his compost pile and mix it in with his compost and it would charge. So it's another simple backyard system. Nice, I like that, running the whole thing through the chipper. You know, let me talk a little bit about crushing biochar because you know, when I, we have, I have these kilns now, so now I'm making lots of char and driving it over it, you know, it works, but it's a little tedious. So I've tried a lot of different ways to crush it. When it's dry, you can run it through a chipper really easy, uh, you know, like especially one with a hammer mill that shreds a leaf shredder, but you're gonna get a dust storm. If it's too wet, if it's, if it's pretty wet and you put it through that hammer mill, it's, it's just going to clog. It's, it's like paste. It's really sticky. If I get it right, it, there's a certain sweet spot of dryness where it goes through without making dust. So I usually wait for that. But I just bought a, a, an electric driven hammer mill, a really small one because it was a straight through whereas my pioneer chipper you know you, you drop it in the top but then it goes around the circle and comes out so that would clog really easily so i thought thought the straight through one would work better and it worked really great with really wet char so it's just what a hammer mill is it's just these flails you put the stuff in the top and there's a screen in the bottom with um like quarter inch hole size holes 
so it comes drops through the the hammers beat against that screen and the stuff goes through the screen well when i put it in when it was pretty wet just quenched it came out like soft serve ice cream <laughs> <laughs> and it was really fine so if I wanted biochar powder that was a great way to make it so I dump it in there and this black extruded stuff would come out um, but I wanted also some bigger particle size stuff so I let it dry but I guess it's not dry enough because I put that stuff through the other day and it completely clogged it like that so yeah it's a little bit of a problem people have tried all kinds of things they have a great crusher seems to work. Um, they have, I have one, one friend who has a concrete slab at his shop and he gets a lawn roller and pulls it with his ATV. So he gets a more even, it's better than truck tires. Um, how else have people tried to crush tar? A front loader smash. Yeah, yeah, that would work. Um, so, you know, in, in ag big ag systems, we haven't talked about that very much, but uh, applying the biochar in a, in a, you know, on a, on a field level, um, there's some really interesting ideas there. In Australia, they're, are, they're doing that soft serve approach with an extruder. It's actually some kind of uh, machine they have from the food industry. It's a mixer extruder, and they're mixing it with, I think they're mixing it with manure and then extruding it out into a slurry and then they have a deep injection system so they're going through a field and they're like cutting it with a chisel plow and injecting it kind of deep in the soil and that's giving them good results um, another thing that you could think about for a, a larger scale like if you had a, a rangeland you wanted to get char out on a rangeland if you're doing you know if you've got pin pinion juniper you're getting rid of and you want to get the char in the soil and the rangeland, you just get a rangeland drill. And if you can get the char the right consistency, you could potentially just put it in the seed box and apply it like, like just like you would seed or fertilizer with a rangeland or a no-till drill. Um, so that's one option. Uh, one gentleman was asking me about turf. You know, gar golf courses are starting to use char now. In fact, it was one of the original um, uses for char was golf courses. Um, one of the biochar textbooks has a picture of an ad from the 1920s that talks about putting charcoal in a golf course. So, um, so to do that, to get it into turf, you use an aerator. You punch those little holes, and then you spread the char, and it'll go right down into the little holes, and that's how you apply it. Um, you can use a manure spreader, especially if you, or, or a compost spreader. So really that's probably the easiest way if you're, if you're doing an organic system and you're already applying manure or compost, then you're going to just mix it right in. And on an industrial scale, really, the best, the best way to use char is going to be to use it first in a composting or manure management operation. There is a huge potential to use it in dairies and solve a couple of problems at once. So dairy wastewater is uh, a big pollution problem. And um, so you can add dairy right in the, you can add biochar right in the dairy stalls. And if you've got a wash down system, it'll go into a lagoon. It'll help suppress the odors in the lagoon and absorb the nitrogen in the lagoon. And then it will also, when you pre press out the solids, it'll be in the solids, so it'll help that compost better. So. There's just huge applications in animal agriculture for char, improving um, conditions for the animals, improving the environmental output, and, and producing really valuable soil amendments. We've had good luck with lime spreader as well. Uh, when we were putting uh, acres of char out on a site in the Uinta Basin here last year, we hired good. a lime spreader. Time for another uh, load. Commercial. Stay away from that terminology because it really does refer to activated carbon. Quit. 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 Is everybody for that? Quit. Yeah? Quit. Okay. Phones are ready. Get phones your phones ready. ready. I might need to back it up. Looks it looks like a lot.
right there. And there that didn't get burned. <laughs> there it is. Slide in. Black and greasy, baby.